Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Finding Me on the ITV Networks. Today with one of my favorite professors, Professor Lorenzo Fioramonti. We've had him before on the show, but I think this time is an exceptional moment because we're going to talk about his book, Wellbeing Economy. It has been discussed extensively in the financial and economic circles, has been reviewed on Financial Times, shortlisted by McKinsey. But what is amazing about this is that although the, the contemporary or the commercial aspect of the financial and economic sector is reviewing what Lorenzo has written, Lorenzo has actually presented something that is totally against the grain. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, Lorenzo, for making this time. It's taken us a long time to get here. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me again. So, I mean, the, the title of the book, Wellbeing Economy, is incredible because it says something. What led you here? What inspired you to come up with this? Because it's a shift now from gross domestic problem. Well, I thought that in order for change to happen, uh, we needed to inspire people. I wanted to have a clear, an easy to read critique of our main ideology of growth, of economic growth, but I wanted it to be inspiring. I wanted it to send a positive message. And if you think about it, what is the opposite of growth? I believe it's well-being, an economy that can create well-being. And I thought this title would work pretty well. And also, if you've noticed, the acronym well-being economy means W-E, we. Mm -hmm. The idea that we can change the economy. We have built an economy that is based on growth, we can build another one based on well-being. It's just a game and the economic system is made by humans and humans can alter it and change it for the greater good. So when you say well-being is one economy and then growth is another, would you say then you are countering this notion that in order to get well-being we have to shift from the understanding of growth? Yes, I mean let me be clear, I'm not against better quality of life for people. You know, a lot of people think that growth means we're all going to be better, mm. okay? And if this was true, I would love growth. But this is not true. People do not necessarily understand what we mean by growth. Growth simply means that more money moves in the economy. And money can move for good reasons, but can also move for bad reasons. Right. More traffic jams mean more money. More accidents mean more money. More debts mean more money. In South Africa, the largest economic sector by employment level is security. So we're creating value for growth because we fear one another. We build gates, electric fences, and so on and so forth. So I'm not against the idea of a better life. Mm -hmm. I believe we are confused. Growth, as we've seen in my research shows, that for the past 30 years globally, especially in countries like South Africa, most of our growth has not been due to good transactions, to money that moved to increase our quality of life. Actually, most of it was due to the negative ones, pollution that requires fixing, water that is contaminated, that requires bottled water, more security, more crime, and so on and so forth. That's why I want to focus on well-being. Let's focus on the things that really make our lives better. What are they? An economy should incentivize those and should disincentivize the ones that actually come uh, to the detriment of, of our well-being. So when you speak of well-being again then, in terms for the ordinary person to understand, are you then measuring uh, the life of people in terms of happiness which also includes some kind of financial stabilities, is that your, your priority, your focus, rather than only just making more money? Exactly. It is. So let, let, me, let me be clear on this one as well. Oh. Um, for, for the growth economy, m you know, having conversations, spending time in the community, spending time in the family, working with your kids, working mm -hmm. as a volunteer, all of these things do not really matter for development because they don't move money. They come at no cost. But that's insane. We know, we know very well that an economy couldn't function without the social capital, the trust and the cohesion as right. a society, right? Mm -hmm. The same applies to nature. If I keep my ecosystems intact, although they provide services to mm -hmm. us, that doesn't count for the growth economy. For them to become valuable, I need to destroy them. I need to commodify them. I need to sell them on markets. Chopping trees adds to growth. Mm. Keeping them intact, letting grow a forest grow doesn't add to growth. So what I'm saying is that we know, we know that well-being is a proxy, is a consequence of good social relations and healthy environments. Now, the growth economy is destroying the foundations of well-being. So 
Focusing on well-being means focusing on business activities that instead of destroying nature, regenerate nature, mm. rather than killing social cohesion and making our society more and more, less and less trustful of each other, it's businesses that increase the ability of people to come together and work collaboratively. So it's not about happiness, like in a, sen mm. in a, gen in a general sense, although I believe happiness is important, it's really objective. It's looking at what is that really makes a society a good society and then focusing on economic systems and processes that instead of destroying those foundations, really enhance them. But then in many ways you will be a challenge to corporates because although corporates have started to adopt the social responsibility, at the end of the day, the basic eth etiquette in a corporate is to maximize profit. And if you look at you speaking about family time, social cohesion, you know, these cultural gatherings, etc., everything in the corporate world is totally against this. I mean, one of the companies has actually shortlisted your book. I think at the time of employment, when you go there, they'll tell you, be prepared to work a 16 to 18 hour day. So removing from those kinds of elements that you're speaking about in terms of well-being. So how, how do you envision the possibility of change to a well-being economy from the very corporates and, and leaders in the economy, um, you know, adopting this idea, changing their mindset? Well, I divide the corporate world, the business world, the private sector into good companies and bad companies. <laughs> okay. It's not true that all companies are simply interested in the maximization of profits. Right. There are many companies out there that are doing a good job. Many companies that work on renewable energy and are trying to outcompete fossil fuel industries, mm. right? So it is true. My book is a challenge to the bad companies. My book is a challenge to a company that doesn't care about society, that doesn't care about the environment. My book is a challenge to any corporate system that is only interested in generating profits without any recognition of the losses that society has to face once those, business, once those activities are, uh, are underway. But it's at the same time a great the way forward for all those businesses that are trying to succeed but with the social and an ecological uh, and an ecological approach mm. and there are many of these um, just like in the fossil fuel versus green energy systems the same applies to manufacturing my book is a manifesto for small companies small businesses to thrive and it's against shopping malls and it's against large-scale manufacturing so so it's it's not it's not entirely true that you know corporate world is a monolith it is mostly dominated by a few big corporations, and I think that is a sign of the past. The future should be about creating millions and millions of small and medium enterprises, even micro enterprises, and letting them thrive. In the current economy, they cannot thrive because they're constantly outcompeted by these guys that make a lot of money at the expense of society, but society never asks for that money back. So now you're in, in South Africa, and I see you've got here on, on the cover of your book, How to Change South Africa. And we have, in the city that we're living now, we have a new mayor and, and hopefully a new vision. Have you engaged with the DA and with our new mayor, with Salim Simange, because he has put forward a plan to say that there's going to be a change in the way Gauteng, I mean, the way in which Pretoria is going to be managed, um, the new systems that will be in, put into place, etc. Because from what I saw in his recent tweets, his focus was on developing already developed areas. His focus was on commercializing more, for example, the airport, etc. And in my understanding, that went against the kind of things that you were writing about. Yes, okay, so I haven't directly engaged with any um, main political party at this stage, although I have had contacts with a lot of politicians individually, but nothing structural, and with politicians from many different parties. The subtitle of the book is important. Mm -hmm. Well-being economy, but the subtitle says how okay. to succeed in a world without growth. Mm. Okay, so this is important. The message I want to send is not only that I have enough information, my research shows that the growth model that we have is wrong, it's myopic and short-sighted. Right. But also if people do not believe that argument, the reality is that that growth model is not generating growth anymore. Mm. We're at zero. We're in a technical recession in South Africa and all the indications are that we're gonna be in for the long haul. This is not gonna change tomorrow. So the question then becomes to politicians, mm. how do you intend to make South Africa thrive with the model that hasn't generated positive outcomes in the past 20 years when we had a lot of growth, now that we're not going to have a lot of growth. Right. That's why my message to the mayor is, 
If you think you're going to create jobs out of building more shopping malls and making the rich areas richer, you are dreaming. The future is about trying to level the playing field, trying to redistribute opportunities and resources and doing it in a way which is intelligent and creative rather than simply nationalizing our resources as some parties would like to do. That is the only opportunity we have. What hasn't happened yet in South Africa is the realization that you cannot continue telling people that things will be better by using the medicine that hasn't worked in the past when we had a lot of it. Imagine how well it would work now in the future when our resources are going to become scarce and scarcer. Mm. So unless we creating the right innovation and the right approach with different narratives, with different ideas, we're simply going to repeat the same mistakes. Okay, so we have to go to a break, but when we come back, I want you to give us a practical example for, for young individuals, young entrepreneurs, you know, the very hungry, youthful individuals who are sitting here and realizing that, you know what, following the old guys is actually not a good idea anymore because it's not generating anything. We want to do something, but then how do we enter the well-being economy? Is there a process of entering the well-being economy? But we'll come to that after the break, so we'll see you then. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment today on Finding Me in the ITP Networks with Professor Fira Monti and we're speaking well-being economy, how to change South Africa and I think that's very very important because many of us I think Prof are at a phase where we're quite despondent. We feel like, you know, change is supposed to be the only constant, but in South Africa, it seems like it's not happening. So are we an anomaly? Are we isolated? Like, what are the challenges? But I, I posed a question to you. For all the young minds, those who are searching, who are fed up and frustrated, and I've been speaking to a lot of young individuals, you know, the, the graduates who have just left the university, have entered the corporate world, have entered employment, and, and they're in that space, and they say, uh-uh. This is not what we should be doing. This is not what life is about. This is not how you start, how you begin, how you contribute. How do they then enter the well-being economy? So, so far I've, I've mentioned the fact that you know, our growth ideology doesn't really care about society and doesn't really care about nature. Mm -hmm. In many ways it only sees development when we exploit both. But there's also another element that is irrelevant to growth and that is our fulfillment, yes. our personal sentiments. And so we simply think that we can fix growth by making it greener and more inclusive. And what about meaning? What about purpose? What about psychological well-being? And I think that is central to the idea of a well-being economy. Right. A well-being economy is not just going to be greener, more sustainable and more inclusive. It's also going to be much more uh, dignity-based and much more fulfilling for many young people who believe that work shouldn't just be a way of getting an income, but it should actually be about making a difference in mm -hmm. society. Many more people do not simply see a job as an opportunity to buy a bigger car and to have a swimming pool, but actually as, as a way of participating in society. What is work? It's in a sense, it's a, a form of participation, right? Yeah. And if and if you, your work is not fulfilling, you're participating. You're spending a lot of your time doing things that are against your own values. Isn't that crazy? How many people out there spend every day eight to nine, ten hours to do something that if you ask them individually, they will tell you. It's against my principles and my values. And, they and don't I do enjoy it all the time. Yeah, and, and you were speaking earlier, you are speaking about the bullshit jobs you were telling us, like what the... Uh, Absolutely, I mean like, and what, what is the craziest thing is that not only are most of our jobs forcing us to do things we wouldn't want to do mm -hmm. in normal conditions, but actually they're forcing us to get humiliated. Um, you know, most of the jobs we're producing with the shopping malls, with this approach to consumption, are what the World Economic Forum calls bullshit jobs. <laughs> These are not fulfilling or short term. They erode the dignity of our youngsters. They, instead of building on their creativity and inspiration, they're actually demoting them. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the opposite. What we need, we have the opportunity of being on the cusp of some major systemic change. Growth is not happening. The future will be about more and more frustrated people unless we change direction. Guess what? We have enough research that says youngsters are valuing things that are very different from the previous generations. To me, that's a perfect mix. Youngsters want something different. The old system doesn't work anyway. Let's move forward with something that is inspiring. Let's create jobs that are really about creativity and, and, and uh, you know, like progressive jobs that mm -hmm. are able 
to re-embed people in society and, 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 and natural systems. Let them be very creative. Let them be able to have a positive impact on society. I'm in extremely inspired every time I present the book. I've got flocks of social entrepreneurs coming. And many of them say to mm. me, we don't want to be entrepreneurs, period. We want to be social innovators. We're not interested in maximizing our bank accounts. We want to make money, but every day we want to know that our money is quality money. It's money that has made a positive inference for society and for nature. Those are the things we should be teaching our students rather than yes. simply replicating the old paradigms and more and more mining and more and more corporate dominance and more and more, you know, like private banking and all things that are increasing inequalities and destroying nature rather than regenerating. So there's two things that you said here that I've picked up now immediately and, and it's from an Islamic point of view. Uh, it's something that I'm, I meant to ask you. And the first thing is that in Islam, I'm sure you've heard of the concept of zakat. And zakat is uh, a tax that is paid on the excess wealth that you have. So after a certain amount and it's on capital accumulated that is not being used. The current economic or financial system as it is, it actually encourages this large amassing of wealth which is not used for the benefit of the larger population. But you're telling me now there are people who want to shift even the mindset, changing the terminology from entrepreneurs to social innovators, so that we want to use this wealth constructively. Now, zakat, in my opinion, is a constructive use also of wealth because it's contributing to the well-being. What is your, 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 your take on this? And, and would you say that it is, it is something that we should look at in terms of even maybe taxing this excessive amount of wealth that lies there but does not benefit? Yes, um, I think we should look at all possible approaches and, and uh, one thing that the growth economy has done very poorly was simply to standardize development around the world. Mm. You know, We were told for the past roughly 85 years that all countries and all cultures develop the same way, that growth means the same everywhere. And so whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, whether you are an Aborigine in Africa or Australia or whether you are any form of cultural group, it doesn't matter. We all aspire to the same things. Mm -hmm. That's not true. It's factually not true. Actually, in the well-being economy perspective, each and every society, each and every country should be able to identify special, its own goals mm -hmm. and how to achieve them rather than competing in the same beauty context as if everything was standardized. But what you're saying is very, very important. I'm not against wealth. I think if wealth has been accumulated and uh, based on the right principles, doing the right things, I think people who have a lot of money should enjoy that money. However, most of the wealth we have in today's world hasn't been accumulated with the right principles and processes. We know that taxation has been skewed towards labor rather than capital gains. This is recognized around the world. We pay much more tax from work mm -hmm. when we work rather than making money out of money, which is crazy. When we work, we do something that is real, that actually Productive. has an impact. Yeah, Productive, yeah, yeah. whether we like it or not. Yeah. But when we sit on money and make more money out of that, we're not doing anything productive. So if anything, we should have more tax on capital than on labor. Um, at the same time, we have never asked ourselves, how do people make money in the first place? If you make money at the expense of society, mm. as we have seen, for instance, the UN has a beautiful research that came out a few years ago that shows that the top 20 industrial sectors in the world, and these include all the fossil fuel energy corporations, the mining industry, the food production systems, okay, large commercial farming, they generate more losses for our natural ecosystems than gains. So if we were to ask them to pay the bill for the damage they've created, they would run out of money. They don't make enough money to actually pay for the damage. Isn't that insane? We yes. see those sectors as being productive, but actually those sectors are not productive. So in the well-being economy, you shouldn't incentivize the kind of um, economic activity. You should incentivize an economic activity that if it has an impact, a negative impact on nature, it's able to generate more resources to fix it and, and, actually, mm -hmm. and actually tackle all the different negative consequences. So, and also, we need to realize that when we are in societies with excessive levels of inequality, everybody loses, even those that are better off. Yes. More unequal societies tend to have higher levels of crime. Mm -hmm. More unequal, and crime tackle, you know, attacks, you know, is a problem for everyone. More unequal societies tend to have lower levels of education and proficiency mm -hmm. because schools tend to be more segregated and diversity helps actually the intelligence and the education of our children. They tend to have more epidemics and diseases because they tend to invest less on welfare, then poor people get sick and eventually viruses spread from the poor people to the rich people. So level, uh, levels of life expectancy are much lower in very unequal societies when compared to less unequal societies. Mm. So this is just to say, 
Whatever form we use, whether it's a, it's a Muslim approach to reducing wealth inequality, to, to taxing wealth more than labor, or any other form, the reality is that greater equality is better for everyone. The rich should be the first to demand greater equality because they have got so much to gain out of it. So part of what you said now, and I have to come back to the previous thought that was in my mind as you were speaking, let me capitalize on that right now, is on education. You spoke about education. Do you think there needs to be a change in terms of the education system, especially what is being taught and how the universities are structured in order to create that mindset that we need a shift towards a well-being economy, towards a well-being university, towards a well-being academic? You know, all of these things contribute to that better society ultimately, because if you're regenerating much of the same, you're not going to change the greater society. You're spot on. I mean, the reality is that from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, either because of jobs or because of schools and education and cultural discourse and the TV and radio and the media, we're basically propagating the values that are against what we really, really want as mm -hmm. a society, even as a, as, a, as a world. And we're talking about uh, fighting inequality, we're talking about more collaboration, we're talking about batting nature and so on and so forth. And then we send our kids to school and what do they learn? They learn exactly the opposite. Yes. They learn that competition is going to take you places rather than collaboration. Mm -hmm. Most of our kids are not taught how to collaborate. Yes. You know, we told them that mm -hmm. sharing is caring except when they go to school. And then all of a sudden you get ranked for being a more proficient student. So it's all about this pyramid structure. It's about, it's about exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the pyramid is about competition. It's about you know, doing better than your neighbor rather than supporting your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this experience myself in many South African schools. When I started sending my kids to school, I was really, really um, taken aback by the language, the corporate, how the, the idea of corporate success has basically colonized our primary, even pre-primary schools to the point that kids are, um, you know, like really exposed to business success as if it wasn't a collaborative effort, but it was like one man's single uh, competitive enterprise. So, and this is really at all levels. Universities, I mean, let's face it, um, universities have become assembly lines of degrees. Yes. Uh, this is what they are. They're only interested in words like throughput, how many students we are graduating without really caring about the quality of what we do. Uh, they're interested in how productive academics are, again, without looking at the quality of what we produce. So, so there is a perverse incentive to basically become a factory that rather than producing cars, is now producing degrees. Uh, and this productivity is against relevance, isn't it? Absolutely, and against any impact on the local, the local community. I mean, we're all forced to compete globally with our universities for these rankings rather than asking ourselves the question, what is the purpose of university in South Africa? In my view, the purpose is to improve the quality of life in South Africa. So my first duty is to my students, is to the community around my university. Mm -hmm. How do I use what I have to improve the quality of life around my university? We're fencing ourselves off the community rather than opening our gates so that the communities could be part of this. So it's exactly the opposite. Um, we have starving students on some of these campuses. Yeah. It cannot get University food. of Pretoria as well. And rather than, rather than looking at this as a political problem and trying to really change our systems, we have become a food desert on this campus. There are no food operators, certainly not local food operators. We have a few chains as if that's what we need. Rather than having local healthy food, we're actually outsourcing everything to a bunch of fast food chains mm -hmm. that are coming here and taking the money away while providing uh, uh, unhealthy food to our students. So need. it's really the opposite. So, so the, the university as well as the entire schooling system has to change. And the question is, if we are to build an economy that pursues well-being, what kind of skills do we need? We probably need fewer CEOs, fewer accountants, fewer lawyers. So we need more nurses and more teachers, more educators. We need people that can actually build the skills of the future that in many different ways are artisans and carpentry and so on. And so Agriculture, forth. horticulture, Absolutely. those in nature Absolutely. environment. We're very quickly approaching the end and I really want to get this question in. I just saw recently that Iran has built perhaps what is considered one of the biggest bookstores in the world and it's, it's like a garden, a, a, a concept of a garden, you know, with different bookstores, um, uh, basic centers for children to come and read, etc. So encouraging this. Shouldn't the university also be a microcosm of that? That I mean, and if you look at the University of Pretoria, we have exactly one bookstore on the entire campus. We have none of the social, cultural, environment, um, you know, functionalities that should build the, the student into somebody who is going to be one who engages in society 
we're creating this kind of idea that you come in, go into the lecture hall, do your work, and then after that you go and have a drink in the pub, uh, go and party in, in, the, in the clubs or that are centered around Hatfield, but nothing else. There isn't that environment of that well-being that you speak about. Yeah, most of our universities are very stale mm. And, mm. and uninspiring. And you mentioned the, 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 the bookshop. I believe our bookshop on campus it has got nothing to do with campus. I mean, like often in the windows, I see Jamie Oliver's latest books. <laughs> so it's like it could be a bookstore anywhere else, rather yeah. than showcasing the, the research done and the publications done by researchers on this campus. Or even students. Say, even students. And yeah. rather than encouraging, you know, like philosophical cafes and conversations yes. yeah. and open, you know, like open book launches, they are inward looking. They're mostly like a photocopy center rather than a bookstore. And I think campus really, we have so many resources on this campus. Yes. We've got parks and we should open up to the community. We should be the ones leading the cultural revolution of our neighborhood rather than rather than being so inward looking. And part of that cultural revolution would be also to include like second-hand bookstores. Absolutely. Encourage people to come and sit down and engage with what was Book in the clubs, past. Book clubs, you, know, like, yeah. you know, like sharing of books and sharing of any other things. I mean, like I've been dreaming of speaker corners. Why don't we have a section on campus where anybody can come and talk about daily issues, politics, about, uh, you know, like economic transformation, I anything. I raised this know. a few years ago, so Lorenzo, we're still banging our head against the wall. We're at the end, what's your parting advice? Sorry? We're at the end now, so what would be your parting advice? I would say to anyone, ask yourself how you can be part of this. What can you do? How can you disrupt the day-to-day -day routines that are not fulfilling and actually making you do what you don't want to really do? And how can you be part of this? And you can be part of this in many different ways. Changing the way you work, changing the way you teach, changing the way you operate within the family and the community. Any level matters. When we are hundreds of thousands of people trying to change this stupid game we call economic growth, we're basically part of the solution. And we can do it in South Africa. And we can create this well-being economy, but we can create a well-being South Africa as well. I suppose. Absolutely. Give ourselves a healthy bill at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for sharing your, idea and, uh, your ideas and, of course, your, your beautiful work. And, and I would like to encourage as many of the viewers as possible to try and get this book, read it. It will definitely help you to envision a new lifestyle, perhaps a new South Africa, and contribute, as Lorenzo said, in a small way, because ultimately it's all about the ripple effect. So thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you for being here. Fi amanillah wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.